guys, Model Rock 321 here on a little road trip. No launch today. It would have been a launch, but this road trip will take the place of a launch and I will be back in the field real soon. So today we are heading to the Titan Missile Museum in Southern Arizona. It's in Tucson. And then after that, we'll be heading to the Pima Air and Space Museum. These are two places I always wanted to go to. And I have somebody with me. Say hello there, hello. Marcy. Launch Commander hey, with me. Right. So yeah, that's what's going on right now, and this will just be a documentary style video. Just want to uh, see what the Titan Missile Museum is all about. It's deep underground. It's gonna be cool. Go see what's up with it. All right, you guys. All right, guys. So we arrived at the Titan Missile Museum. It's about a two-hour drive from the Phoenix area. Um, left when it was dark. Got here just now. The museum is actually not open yet. So here, nice and early, which works out perfectly. I like to be early because when you're early you're on time so let's check it out all right entering the titan missile museum it should be pretty cool wow look at that big antenna yeah so we are here What are you checking out? That's for a purse. I like it. There's another tight up there on the wall. That's the Jiminy Titan. It's got the people in it. Chimney Titan. And here we have people getting in the way. <laughs> we are here, folks, at the Titan Missile Museum. Here we got Goddard. First liquid fuel rocket. V2s. Emergency drinking water. What do you say? I said it's cool that be, be a Star Trek oh, hero. Yeah, he was here. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. LeVar Burton. I know him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. And then this is their um, schedule shooting. First time for shooting oh, schedule. Mm, Star Trek. Oh, they filmed out here. Star Trek out here. That's okay. That's cool. Yes, it is. Life magazine. Can you survive Cold War? Yeah, Cold War stuff. I don't like that. War and most importantly safety factors as we walk down the 55 steps and 55 steps back up. Everybody can do that. Okay, piece of cake. In fact, the steps have been modified for your safety. They're not grates anymore. We've actually put steps there. So uh, 
I get to do about four or five times a day. I need the exercise in anyway, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of uh, pieces of information about the Titan II here in Tucson, Arizona. If you're not from this area, we had 18 Titan sites around Tucson, Arizona. This is number 18 we were allowed to keep as a museum. The other 17 were imploded, destroyed, per the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks Treaty with the Russians, then the Soviet Union. So we were at Cold War with the Soviet Union back in the late 50s, Sputnik uh, in the early 60s. So we developed these two concepts, peace through deterrence and mutually assured destruction, the concept of MAD. No, I'm not mad at you. But mutually assured <laughs> destruction ensures peace through deterrence, which means if you attack me, I'm going to attack you. It's a lose-lose situation with nuclear weapons. And the Titan II had a nine megaton warhead. That's nine million tons of TNT. You compare that to Hiroshima or Nagasaki, that was uh, 16,000 tons of TNT. So nine megatons, and the missileers named it the City Buster for a reason, okay? I was in Minuteman III up in North Dakota for about five years. Very familiar with Titan missile system to establish my credibility. Very familiar, pretty much the same type of system, but they had the bigger bomb, we didn't. We had different targets that we had to target and that kind of thing. So I love questions, we'll ask questions. If you wanna wait till we get top slides, so we're gonna start up here, go on the ground, do our thing, and I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Once the video is over, we're gonna to go to what's called the access portal. And then we're gonna head down these 55 steps. I wanna follow you all down to what's called the blast lock area. After the blast lock area, we're gonna head into the launch control complex. Hey, sir, come on in. Right, we just started. Too. No worries. Right. We're gonna go into the launch control complex and I'll describe what's happening there. We'll spend a good amount of time in here. Then back through the cableway to the business end of what we do here in Titan II. The big guy, I call it, all right? I think you'll really enjoy this. If you haven't done this, uh, I enjoy doing it every day because it gives me a chance to get back into my environment. The Titan, real quick, again, 18 sites were in and around Tucson. Uh, they typically were seven to eight miles apart. So if you're a hiker, if you want to go to Madera Canyon, which I highly recommend, if you want to hike Madera Canyon, if you're driving to Madera Canyon on the right-hand side, I think there's a sign that says cattle crossing or whatever. There's an access road there. If you drive up that access road, it's chained off and it says no trespassing. Well, I've jumped over the chain. <laughs> there's an imploded Titan site there. And all you're going to see is a bunch of blown up concrete, a hole in the ground, and that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to head Interstate 10 East to Emporita Road Exit, the Titan site is right there off of the interstate. You can't miss it. Somebody, whoever owns the property, hung a sign that has a nuclear detonation on the sign. No trespassing. I went over there and looked at that too. I mean, it's okay <laughs> as long as you explain to the sheriff, hey, here's why I'm here. The Cold War developed in the late 1940s after World War II when distrust rose between the United States and the Soviet Union. These former allies were now in a geopolitical fight for global influence. A key part of the Cold War was an arms race between the world's two superpowers. The focal point of the battle for military superiority was nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. Both sides developed what became known as a nuclear triad, which is an integrated system of delivering these destructive payloads by air, sea, and land. What I want to do real quick is talk about the typical Titan crew day. So a Titan crew had four members on it two officers and two enlisted members, okay? Two officers, two enlisted. And they would start their day at Davis Monthan Air Force Base here in Tucson, Arizona at the 390th Strategic Missile Wing. They go through what's called a pre-departure briefing. In that briefing, they would receive real world security threats. They receive what's happening out here with respect to maintenance, both topside and downstairs. Once they get all this information together, receive their authenticator codes that I'll talk about in a minute, they head out in their, their government vehicles and they'll go to what's called the access gate. Now remember, Tite, uh, Tucson had 18 Titan sites, seven to eight miles apart. This is the last remaining Titan site here in Tucson, Arizona. There were a total of 54 in our country. The other 36 were in Kansas and Arkansas. So the crew would show up at this gate, the access gate we call it, 
and there they would call the crew commander downstairs in the launch control center and go, hey, we're all secure, this is so-and-so, etc. The crew commander downstairs would buzz them through that gate. By the time they came through the gate, they had three minutes to make the next phone call of four. Four phone calls total. They'd have to go down the access portal, and there's a closed circuit camera there showing the crew downstairs, hey, they look secure, they're not being coerced, no gun to the head, that kind of thing. All right, the third phone call was when the crew commander that's coming in, the new commander, would authenticate with a crew commander downstairs. And he had an authenticator code in alphanumeric, like <coughs> Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, I pass you. And that would, no kidding, tell the crew downstairs, these folks, this crew is secure. And they would get buzzed to these various doors all the way down to what's called the blast lock. And that's where I'll stop and, and tell you what we do with the fourth phone call once we get down to the blast lock. So be careful walking down the stairs, use the handles. The, the steel doors on my right hand side over here, just open that door and head down the stairs. And when you see two huge concrete blast doors, that's where I'll meet you because I'm gonna follow you down. Yeah, they may not be here. You have you don't even know on hikes or anything? Oh yeah, my wife saw a six foot rattlesnake at Madeira. Ooh. So folks, we're in what's called the blast lock area. <clears throat> it's a sort of set several purposes. It protects the crew from natural disasters, attack, and nuclear detonation. You notice these huge steel and concrete blast doors? We're gonna to get to the internal part of the blast lock in a minute, but you got about five feet of concrete, six feet of concrete all around you, all the way through. And if you look at this metal around the side of the door, back in the Cold War, it had neoprene rubber on it. And what that would do, if there was a nuclear detonation, it would prevent an electromagnetic pulse from entering the launch control complex and disrupting all the electronics thereby destroying your mission of launching that Type II missile. And we're going to do a launch. You have seen that yet? We'll have some fun with that. If you look at this door, though, there's four hydraulic pins on each of these doors. There's two in the blast lock that protect the crew, again, and there's two over here that protect the crew down the cableway from a missile detonation if it blows up in the silo and the missile launch, most importantly. Okay? So let's head in. Oh, I'm sorry, one second. The fourth phone call is made here. So the oncoming crew commander would call the crew commander inside the launch control center, and within two seconds of each other, they push that white button to open this huge blast door. They couldn't open this one until this one was secure and closed. So again, electromagnetic pulse protecting, and again, it protected the crew from any type of attack topside for sure. All right, so what we're gonna do, watch your step on these grates. Uh, we're gonna head left here into the launch control complex. I think you'll be amazed at how large it really is. All right, follow me. Watch your heads. As we walk in here, you're going to see the shock absorber looking things. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Everything underground is shock isolated for nuclear detonation or earthquake. Wow. So watch your steps. Unlike the system I was associated with, we're uh, a much smaller two-person crew, not a four-person crew like here. So here I need two volunteers. But you're videotaping, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, sir. Uh, sir, you're the commander of this crew. Fantastic. Congratulations. You'll get a pay raise on that. <laughs> I guarantee you. All right, now I need a deputy. I need another volunteer here. Oh, go for it. <laughs> nice, comfy chairs for the entire tour down here. Look at this. So what you're in is the launch control complex, I call it. And where you're at right now, I call it the nerve center. This is the launch control center. It monitors all the systems of the launch control center, the missile, topside, downstairs, everything electronic is in this area here. There's three levels to the place you're in right now. Upstairs are the crew quarters. You have your military style bunk beds with those beautiful army green blankets. You got a kitchen with a small range. You had a table where they could study, work on their education, and that kind of thing. The third level below housed the circuit breaker panels, the diesel generator, batteries, everything to support the launch control center and the missile, as you'll see as we go through our tour today. Now, picture yourself in a concrete egg. You're in that concrete egg right now. And this concrete egg, like I shared with you earlier, is on shock isolation. If you look to my left, and look to my right, you see these huge springs? There's eight of those here. 
And what that does is suspends this concrete egg. You're actually floating on air right now inside this big concrete egg in this complex. So if there's a nuclear detonation or an earthquake, this thing's gonna rock and roll and hopefully protect this vital equipment that you need to launch your Titan II intercontinental ballistic missile. And if I throw an acronym at you, come back at me. That's the military, man. I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, we live by those things, too, just 280 feet away. A lot of folks will ask, when it launches, can you hear it in the <laughs> launch control center? I don't know. Never been there and done that. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Wait, <laughs> 28 seconds, remember to charge those batteries? Okay, just tell me what the lights are when they come across. APS power. APS power, 9,000 gallons of water is going to the bottom of that 150 foot deep silo. Okay, silo soft. Silo soft. If a rabbit were to run through those antennas up there, that's what the commander would hear. Security forces respond. Engine. Engine's just fired, causing all that steam and and lift off. So, sparing no expense, Commander and Deputy, we have other cars here. It says, I turn the key. You know? I didn't develop these cars, I really did. As simple as ever. Congratulations, folks. You just launched your ICBM. Good job. Nice, nice, nice. Again, it's great to have you all here. So now, back to the drawing board. Lock entry, you'll see two spacesuits. Remember, Titan was liquid fuel, so the fueling happened upstairs above ground through pipes. They wore those spacesuits for the, the toxicity of the fuel, volatility, and they were not air conditioned. Careful, and yeah. she's so claustrophobic. She says, "Okay, I'm going that way." Oh. Not, this is not a claustrophobic. This, no, this, 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 this is not. So here's those two fueling, heat fueling suits. You can take as many pictures as you want. It looks kind of like a desert cami thing, huh? yeah. but I'm not sure why they have the the, the the tan pattern. People have asked me. I am not sure. Now remember, these are not air conditioned. In Arizona, Tucson, you get 116, 120 degree temperatures in the summer. And yes, we had emergency showers all over the place, eye wash stations, in case you got hydraulic fluid or something on you. God forbid you have a fuel on it. Notice everything is shot by the blue table we were on. <laughs> okay, folks, so look, we have three viewing portals here, one here, there, and around the side. If you want to make space for everybody else, I'll stand over here in the middle so you can hear me. All right, if you look up through the viewing portal to the dark shroud, that shroud protects the warhead from re-entry, from exploding or detonating, okay? So the dark shroud is like there it is. Is. an astronaut's capsule protecting them from the re-entry of the warhead. And here we go. You ready? The missile's 103 feet tall. It's in a 150 foot deep silo. I mentioned that earlier. It's 10 foot in diameter. So the missile full, fully fueled, say that 10 times, is about 337 full speed taking off. Two seven three seven four inches. Taking off. That's how much to us was in that first stage. It took about two and a half minutes to burn all the fuel in the first stage. The second stage, 100,000 pounds of thrust. And in an ideal world, what would happen? Thank you, Commander and Deputy, for launching that missile. All right? So, in an ideal world, the missile launches like you just did. It'll fly 800 miles high out of the Earth's atmosphere until it reaches apogee. What we call apogee when it goes over the curvature of the Earth some 6,300 miles downrange. 
and then it will release the warhead to its intended target. Uh -huh. I'm going down that ninth level where the pit is, where the skateboarding happened. And I said, okay, it's about time to leave. You know, you look up two, you look up the, the, the engine, the two engine nozzles, and I said, yeah, I'm probably head back up here. It was an eerie feeling being under this monstrous, monstrous structure of this icy dam. Marina in North Santa Barbara. I've been privileged to do a Minuteman 3 launch. It was way cool. So they take your missile to Vandenberg and the four-person crew. And they actually launched this thing with a dummy warhead, of course. <laughs> a dummy warhead. They launched it over the Pacific Ocean. All right, guys, I'm on a Rocket 321 here. This is the Titan Missile Museum. This also good uh, close-ups of it. Underground in the silo, 55 steps underground. It's pretty cool. Um, so it's going well. The tour guy's pretty nice, pretty cool guy. Um, so we're going to check out another view of the missile right You know you're in Arizona when you see signs like this. Pretty cool tour if you're ever in Arizona, Tucson. Head on down, check out the Titan Missile Museum. There's an old, I guess, an old Willie's Jeep. Security police for official use only, it says U.S. Air Force from the days of the Cold War. U.S. and Ru Russia. Gonna roll my R for Russia. So, cool. Cool tour. Still a few more sights to see. Out here, about to wrap it up though. This is where you can get a top-down view of the Titan missile through that plexiglass over there. I'm gonna head over there in a minute. So here we go, we got the fuel hard stand powering the Titan. So there are those cables, they all run down under on the ground to the Titan. Very cool. It's a 50-50 blend of hydrazine and unisymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Brand name, Aerozine 50. Hydrogen tetroxide. Moving along. Fuel for the Titan. Fuel for the Titan. So right here I am near the engines. This is the nozzle to the Titan engine. You can see right there. Right there. Yeah, it's huge. Big engine. I'm actually working on my Gemini Titan. This is inspiring. Make me want to go ahead and finish mine up. It's real cool. There are the two nozzles right there. Real good tour, highly recommend it. Silo and launch duct. Level one, level two, level three, water tank, thrust mount. So, see the Titan inside there. Now let's head on up and check it out. see with this glare but yeah wow mm -hmm. all right guys this is a downward view down inside the silo you can see the titan missile this is a cool view except um hopefully this glare hopefully you guys can see that i'm trying to use my hand to shield it yeah it's super it's cool yeah, i think that's good right there and you can see all the way down you can see the black and white roll patterns all the conduits for the wires and everything and that warhead would be on the tip right there Serious firepower. Crazy. And I can see the stars and bars too. If you know what that is. Very cool. Alright guys, Model Rocks 321 here. Back. This is the closing of the video. Just finished the tour at the um, Titan Missile Museum. If you ever get a chance to get down here and check it out, please do. Highly recommend it. It's really nice. Really cool. Piece of history. It's educational. The tour guide was good. Um, recommend it. And it got a pretty cool uh, gift shop. No rockets in there, but Actually, they got one rock, it's $125, a plastic model of the Titan, Jiminy Titan. So I'll catch you guys on another one later. <laughs>